Stop using five apps to manage your marketing. Meet Simplified One. It's an AI-powered all-in-one platform for creators and small businesses to design, make videos, and publish content to all social media platforms. Visit Simplified.com and use Annika30 to save 30% today. Welcome to Your Brand Amplified, the podcast where we interview marketers, publicists, and brands to learn their stories, what makes them tick, and tips and tricks that make a difference. Welcome back to Your Brand Amplified. We're taking a little departure from our last few episodes, which really focused a lot on um, business consulting, quantum leaps, but it kind of also fits with that. It's a great end cap, I think, to this series of podcasts. It's so interesting how that happens because my guest today is Dave Combs. He is a prolific um, songwriter who has built a business with virtually no advertising and done so much to move people with his music and also has a best-selling book. Dave, welcome to the show. Thank you, Annika. It's a pleasure to be here on this beautiful spring day in North Carolina. And I'm sure you're in what, California? I'm in California, yes. Okay. And, well, we've got, we've got the whole country covered then, exactly, don't we? Exactly, we do. <laughs> I was really excited to interview you. Um, I poked around a lot um, at some of your stuff and, um, I really want to hear how you got your start because I, I know you didn't, you were doing some other stuff before you got to music. I, I don't want to give too much away because I want you to tell our audience. Well, I'm, I'm like a lot of, I've, I've listened to some of your other episodes and I could identify with, with a lot of them, especially those uh, entrepreneurs who are, I think one of the gentlemen, Harris, I believe is his last name, mm -hmm. called it a multi-entrepreneur. Yes. Uh, and uh, it's really that kind of described to me, I thought, well, he and I could probably just bounce off of each other all day long here. <laughs> but, but you know, I've, all my life, I have had tons of interests. I just, I'm an inquisitive kid. You know, I, <laughs> I'm the kid that when he got a toy, when nobody was looking, I took it apart, and put it back <laughs> together just to see how it worked. Wow. You know, so it's, it's one of those things. So, so I grew up in, the, in East Tennessee, mm -hmm. uh, up in the mountains of East Tennessee. I'm a, I guess you could call me a Tennessee hillbilly. But I grew up in a family. My mother and father were both uh, musical. They both played the piano. Mm -hmm. My father played by ear. My mother was a, uh, a former school teacher, but my father and my mother grew up on farms. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, a farmer, I guess, is the ultimate entrepreneur. I mean, you are, yeah. <laughs> you are in business for yourself. Ooh. You're at the mercy of the weather and everything else around. And it's, it's a tough job to make a living as a, a small farmer, or maybe even as a large farmer. But they came from that, those were their roots. Mm -hmm. And I think when you come from long lines of families of, of, of a different, of a particular kind of occupation, whether it's farmers or business people, whatever it is, it's kind of in your blood, you know, yeah. you, you, you kind of expect yourself to have those same kind of ideas of independence and making, not depending on anybody else, necessarily for everything that you have but doing things you know creating things if you're a sale you're selling things to people or whatever it is you do as an entrepreneur so i grew up around that and i suppose that even when i was 12 years old in the sixth grade i planted a half acre of potatoes oh my gosh and and babied those suckers all summer long and, and dug them up myself and sold them by the bushel to my elementary school I fed all my fellow students at my elementary school potatoes that wow. year. <laughs> so, and for $5 a bushel, I think it was $5 a bushel that I sold them for, which today that's a great deal. But, yeah, yeah. But anyway, that was, that was kind of the beginnings of an entrepreneurial attitude yeah. and, and concept for me. Well, I want to say, you know, I grew up, I actually grew up in Kansas and okay. my stepdad grew up on a farm and yeah. told me a lot of stories about you know, you have to get up and you, you have to, milk, those cows aren't going to milk themselves in the morning. <laughs> I've heard what, that before. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter, you know, what the weather's like you or what else you think you want to do. You have responsibilities. You have to, like you said, that is true entrepreneurship. You have to get up. You have to take care of everything before you go on to school or whatever else you have going on. When you get back at the end of the day, if you're, you know, a school kid, same thing waits for you. It doesn't yep. stop. That's right. I think that's really good uh, grounding 
for yeah. a great life and, and, and really a foundation for your character and who mm -hmm. you are. And, and I, I have the highest respect for people who, who are farmers and entrepreneurs that do things on their own initiative. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but anyway, I did not, I didn't become a farmer or anything, but <laughs> I did go on to college and I took math as my major physics as my minor. And wow. I worked in the computer center all four years. Mm -hmm. So I'm a very technical oriented person. I got my first job, my first, well, my first and only really job with Western Electric, which okay. you may know of that company. It was yeah. the former, is part of the Bell system. It was mm -hmm. one of the manufacturing arm of the Bell system and it became later AT&T. But I worked for that company for 22 and a half years, mm. starting out as a computer programmer, but then progressing through a lot of different jobs. And all of them though were, uh, had to do with technology. So I was, everything I did was around techno. I love technology and I guess it's come from what I said when I was a kid, I always wanted to know how did something work? I, I didn't want to just play with it. I want to know how does this thing work? And so, you're also musical. Yeah, you know, and with my parents both playing musical instruments, my father played by ear. He, yeah. he didn't, he didn't wow. read music very well, but, but my mother did. And my grandmother Combs, his, my father's mother, she was only four foot eight, born in 1894, and she was hardworking they, you know, on a tobacco farm in southwestern Virginia, but she loved music. And, and a lot of my relatives back then I learned were really musical. They would, could play the guitar or piano or they, were, they loved to sing. But I have with me right here, this is my grandma Combs' instrument that she gave to me at, when she passed away. Wow. In the case where this was, there's a note right over here in the case. It says, this harp belongs to my grandson, David Combs, mm. because every time I went to see Granny Combs, first thing I had to do, she said, Dave, would you, <laughs> or she called me David, would you tune up my auto harp? Mm. And I would sit down and I would tune it up by, by ear and get it so it relatively, it was all good. And then when I got it really sounding good, She'd sit down and she would tear loose on that auto harp and sing hymns that she I can still hear her singing. Oh. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. You know, she could just just go on and on. And I, I love that. And those memories will be I hope I remember those forever. Mm. So music Beautiful. was a huge, huge part of, of my upbringing. And it's probably not too surprising that Eventually, when I was finally 33 years old, I wrote my first song. Now, you may ask, why did it take you 33 years to write a song? Mm -hmm. Well, Annika, there's one principle that I have learned that I have tried to abide by now is what you tell a young person as an adult, mm -hmm. whether you're a teacher, a parent, a friend, when you are talking to an impressionable teenager, young person, what do you say may mean more to them than you ever know. Uh, now you've heard the stories about people being told they could never do something. Yep. And it took them 50 years to find out that they could do something. They could do it. And Those that's what things. they wish they'd been doing that 50 yeah. years ago. So, but nobody had ever told me, Dave, you can write a song. You can write music. I'd all, I, I love music. I love playing everybody else's music. I was a <laughs> choir director in my home church for two years while I was in college. And, you know, I, I love music. It never occurred to me, well, Dave, why don't you write some of your own? You've got your own choir here. They could sing it <laughs> with no problem. But so nobody had ever told me that. But in 1981, I was 33 years old. I sat down at my piano, like the one back here, yep. and I just started playing. Now, this was a normal for me to play music when I got home from work. That's how I relax. You know, a lot of people have a routine. They're, they have their chill out routines, whether mm -hmm. it's to get on a treadmill and exercise or go for a walk or whatever you do. Mine was to sit at the piano and make some music. Wow. And so this particular evening, I sit down at my piano and I start playing a song in the key of C. And it, it, it just sounds really pretty. And I'm playing this song and I get all the way through it. And I didn't think anything about it, but it was a song I had never heard before and I just played it. Now, I cannot explain this any other way than it was an inspiration. It was a song, I was the one chosen to play it for the first time. That's the way I look at it. That's really beautiful. 
And my wife came home from work a couple days later, and she says, Dave, I've been having this song stuck in my head all day long. I've been humming it. What is the name of this song? And she hummed a little bit of it, and I said, well, Linda, it doesn't have a name. And she goes, what? You play it all the time on the piano? I said, <laughs> well, it's just something I made up. And she says, wow, well, have you written it down? I said, well, no, I've, I'm, I've got it up here. I'm not going to forget it. And she says, no, now something might happen to you, and that song would be gone forever. So you better write it down. So yes, ma'am, I did. Part so one. I wrote, <laughs> wrote down the, the melody lines and the, the chords to go along with it on, on a piece of manuscript and stuck it in my piano bench. Well, that was in 1981, about January time frame. 1983, some good friends of ours had a little baby girl, and her name is Rachel. And so we, we were asked by her parents to be her godparents. Well, at little Rachel's christening service, Linda and I are sitting there and, you know, with this one, you've, I'm sure you've been to christening services. Mm -hmm. They're all so touching and special and just precious. And so we're sitting there and at the end of the formal service, I punched Linda and, I, and there was a piano at the front of the church up on the platform, a beautiful baby grand piano. And so I, I said, Linda, what about me playing this song that we could never come up with a name for? How about me playing it now as part of the, this service? And she says, well, that's a great idea. So I went up to Rachel's parents and the minister and said, would it be okay if, if I played a song on the piano now? Okay, that'd be fine. Everybody sits back down. I go over to the piano and I sit down and I start playing this, this tune. And I get almost the way through it, and I hear the sniffles in the crowd, and I, I'm realizing I've got a little some teardrops coming down my cheeks too, because you know, it's, first of all, it's really a special service anyway, and then you top uh, top it off with some really touching music that just turns on the tear ducts. So anyway, at the end of the song, I look up and I, I over at little Rachel in the arms of her mother, and I said, from now on, this song will be called Rachel's song in her honor. And that's how it got its name. So that for me was kind of a really turning point where something that I created really got out of me and into the blessing someone else's life. Yeah. And so that was how the song, Rachel's song, got its name. And you're still working in your day job at this point. Yes. And... You're also writing, now this is your first song and this inspired you to write more songs, but tell the story because not everybody in our audience will know um, the whole story of Rachel's well, song. All right, well, it, you know, so I got it written and got it named. So then what's next? Yeah. Well, you, you roll the, <laughs> the, the calendar forward about three years to 1986. And at this point in my career, I was having to travel around the United States to all of the AT&T Western Electric factories mm -hmm. to help them implement some new software to run their factories. I, that was my specialty. And so I, I was the, I guess, internal consultant to these factories. One of the factories that I had to go to visit and work at was in Nashville, Tennessee. Mm. I think it was divine or ordained by a <laughs> man upstairs that I should be in Nashville, Tennessee. Because Linda says, well, while you're in Nashville, why don't you get a demo recording professionally made yeah. by these musicians in Nashville? And I said, well, well, I hadn't thought about that. That's a great idea. So I said, okay. Well, one evening after work, I get in my rental car and I go driving around downtown Nashville, hoping to find a studio to, that would record Rachel's song for me. Mm -hmm. And I go over into part of town. If you've been to Nashville, it's all it, it earns its reputation as Music City USA oh, yeah. because oh, yeah. there are literally hundreds of studios and everything musical. I was over in the part of town called Music Square, and it's about two square blocks of everything musical. It's got the Country Music Hall of Fame and BMI headquarters, ASCAP headquarters, and the RCA studio that you can tour and wonderful everything musical. I go down this one little side street that's called Roy Acuff Place. Now, some of your audience will remember Roy Acuff was a very famous, well-loved country music person in Nashville, Tennessee. They named a the street after him. So I go down Roy Acuff Place, and on the right, there is this big building that has a barn-like roof to it. And out front is this big water wheel, like you'd find at an old mill, you know, these water, mm -hmm. the grain mills out in the country. Wow. 
and on the side of the building, it says the music mill. And I thought, well, this is encouraging. So I, <laughs> I pull in, I pull in the parking lot, parking, I can see through the glass door. There's a man sitting at a desk in the lobby. I said, okay, I finally found somebody at home today. <laughs> so I, I go knock on the door and George comes to the door, or, or this gentleman comes to the door and introduces himself as George Clinton. Now it's a different George Clinton than everybody else knows. Thanks, but, right. <laughs> but this George Clinton was a recording engineer in Nashville, much loved, much beloved person. And uh, I later found out, but George introduced himself and I told him what I was looking for. And he says, well, come on in, Dave. And as I stepped into the lobby, I look over to my left and up on the wall is a life size picture of Glenn Campbell. Mm. And here's a great big picture of the, the wonderful group called Alabama. Everybody loves the singing of Alabama. Yeah. And here's uh, the Forrester sisters. And then there's gold records and platinum records, you know, all around the walls of this place. So, you know, I'm thinking, wow. You're in very a, good company here. I am in <laughs> really good company here. And I had never been in a studio before in my life. So, George, he says, well, let me give you a tour. There's nobody recording right now, which is unusual. But at this time of night, there was nobody here. And so he said, let's go into Studio A. Studio A is their big studio. So I go in this big room and you could put an orchestra in this, wow. this big room. It was huge. And over in the corner was a great big nine foot grand, you know, concert grand piano and rooms around, you know, isolation rooms around the, the side of the room. And he said, let's go into the, the control room where all the, the magic happens. He said, uh, let me show you something. So he opens this big thick door, soundproof door into this room about that thick. And we go in there and first thing I see is this console the control console for the thing. Yep. It was about eight feet long. I don't have many rows of switch. I think it had 32 channels on it, which is, that's a, that's a lot. It's a big, long console. Sliders and knobs and lights and switches and, you know, cables running everywhere. And I thought, wow, this is incre incredible. And around the walls of the room were these digital rec the tape recorders and the recording equipment. And over in front of the console were these two big, uh, they call them monitor speakers so that mm -hmm. you can hear a really good sounding you're going to sound as good as anywhere and i said george how much does a place like this cost mm. and he <laughs> says well remember this is 1986 he said this is 125 dollars an hour plus engineer and i thought oh boy because in today's dollars that's probably over 400 dollars an hour i mean that's that's way on up there yeah and I wasn't making anywhere close to that <laughs> at AT&T. And he said, uh, well, don't worry about that. He said, the fellow who owns this studio owns a small studio across the street. It's in, in a former little rent house that was mm -hmm. a, a little two bedroom house. And he's converted it into a studio and it has a baby grand piano and a, a small console. But he said, that one's $15 an hour plus engineer. And I said, well, I can do that. <laughs> I said, okay, George, now what I need is I need somebody to play the piano for me, to play my song. And he said, he thought for a second, he said, I know just the person for you. His name is Gary Prim, P-R-I-M. He said, I go to church with him. He's a wonderful studio musician. Everybody loves Gary. He's a great player. He said, he'll do a great job for you. And he said, let me go back to my desk and I'll look up his phone number for him. So he went back and got his Rolodex and looked up Gary Prim and wrote down the phone number for me and gave it to me. Well, I made a beeline back from my to my hotel room and I called. Now, this is before cell phone. I didn't yeah, have yeah. Uh, cell phones hadn't been invented yet <laughs> <laughs> and, and neither had the Internet. So there was no That's Google right. or none, <laughs> none of this stuff. So I go back and I call Gary Prim on the phone, got his answering machine and he called me back in about 30 minutes, introduced himself. I told him what I was looking for and uh, that George Clinton had recommended him and he said, oh, well, I. If, if George said I can do something, he said, I can certainly do that. And uh, he, I said, well, what do you need? And he said, well, I just need two things. I need a recording of you playing the song so I know what it sort of sounds like. Hmm. And then I need a, a lead sheet. And I said, okay, what's a lead sheet? I did not know the, lang the lingo yeah. of the, <laughs> the, the music in Nashville. 
He said, oh, it's just the chords and the, the melody written out on a piece of paper. And I said, well, I've got that. <clears throat> I just didn't know to call it a lead sheet. I already had it. Well, so, at this point, you don't even, because you mentioned you passed ASCAP, you didn't have the song registered, nothing. No, nothing. Because it was just, you know, on a piece of paper is all I had in my, you, in my you head. You had a great wife who gave you a nudge. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you picked up on that real quick, Annika. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of my success in my life, if anything I have done, I can have to attribute to my wife who's upstairs right now. So <laughs> she, my wife, Linda, is a remarkable person. She is a she's a wonderful person in her own. She is the controller of the state of North Carolina, for example, even oh, today. Oh, my gosh. She manages, you know, billions and billions of dollars for the state of North Carolina with 200 people working for her in the state capitol in Raleigh. She's still working and don't tell anybody, but she's going to be 76 pretty soon. That's amazing. She has been working 60 years on her 16th birthday. She went out and got a job. So she's been working ever since she was 16 years old. You both are go-getters. Yeah, I tell you. What and a boy, team. And, and, <laughs> she, and she is too. So anyway, I get the I get back home and I yeah. send Gary Prim the cassette tape and the of me playing it and the, the lead sheet. And I meet Gary in the studio two weeks later going back in Nashville on August the 22nd, 1986 at 6, 30, 6 o'clock p.m. I'll never will forget the date time. It's one of those burned in my memory because <laughs> that's the day I met Gary Prim for the first time, and that's the day that Rachel's song got recorded. Mm -hmm. We go into the studio, and I won't go into all the details, and, and you're going to, when you listen to Rachel's song on my website, and when you go to my homepage, it's right there in the yeah. middle. You can just click it and hear it. Yeah. That is the original recording made by Gary on that day. It hadn't been edited. It hasn't been altered, remastered, anything. You're listening to what I heard for the first time anybody ever played my music. So that, that was incredible. And when Gary finished that recording, which just blew me away because what he created, was, you know, I'd never heard anybody play my music before. It was just mm -hmm. me playing it. What he played sounded as good to me as any song I'd heard on the radio anywhere. I don't care who it was recording it, whether it was Roger Williams or, or Henry Mancini or whatever, it sounded as good as I'd heard. So I was excited, as you can imagine. Yes. And then the, the rest of the story on this, as Paul Harvey would say, <laughs> is that I had I played that song for anybody that would listen to it. <laughs> I had a cassette. They made me a cassette tape that I could play in the, in the rental car. Anybody that went to lunch with me that week, pop, I pop that. You got to listen to this, boys. <laughs> and so it, it was, but everybody loved it. Everybody I played it for loved it. I got back home in, in Winston-Salem and went to lunch with a good friend of mine on a whole totally different matter. And at lunchtime, I was telling him about my recording session on Rachel's song. It turns out the fellow I went to lunch with, his name is Bob McHone. He also was a radio DJ and had a Saturday morning big band jazz program oh, for about okay. three hours where he'd play music and he, he would talk about it. Wonder, he, had, he knew everything there was to know about big band jazz. He, he said, and we were having lunch at a, at a cafeteria, and he said, let's, let's go to my office. I got to hear this song. <laughs> so we went to Bob's office, and we're sitting there in his office. He pops the cassette tape in his boom box there in the office yep. to play it. And I can still see him today. He's, the the boombox is sitting right here, and Bob is right there, right at it, listening. He's got his eyes. You know, when you really want to listen to something, yeah. you close your eyes and just kind of okay. soak it in. And I can hear Bob to this day saying, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> you know, wow. that, that, the universal approval sound. I don't care what language you're in. If you go, <laughs> mm, 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 that means it's good, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> But he's, he was moved. He, he had tears coming down his eyes. He, he said, this is, he said, Dave, this song is a standard. He, he said, this will be a standard. And I said, well, coming from you, Bob, you're an expert in music. I hope you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, Dave, you've got to let me play this on my radio program. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. But all I have is this reel-to-reel -reel master tape. That's the only copy in the world of it. So <laughs> treat it well. So yes. I gave him the master tape, and he went to the radio station. They made a copy. And sure enough, that Saturday morning, my song was played on the radio for the first time. And a strange thing happened. 
the radio station manager called me about an hour later. <laughs> he says, Dave, this has never happened to me. I've been in radio over 20 years and no, this has never happened. He said, as soon as that song got played on the radio, all dozen of our phone lines at the radio station lit up. People were calling in saying, what is that song you're playing? Would you play that again? What was, tell me more about this Rachel song and this Combs guy in Winston-Salem. And he said, you have got something special. So I thought, wow, now, now my real challenge is, okay, how do I get it played on all the other radio stations around the country? Yeah. So to make a long, I did find a way to get the phone numbers for all these easy listening stations. There were about 400 of them around the country. I called a ton of them. And I also found out that there was a company called Bonneville Broadcasting that did programming for radio stations. So I got a hold of one person there that, who he loved Rachel's song. And he said, I'm going to put this in my, all my stations, mm -hmm. 200 of them <laughs> wow. at one time. So you go, you know, that's like walking into a Walmart and, uh, and saying, <laughs> we're going to put this in all of our stores. Boom, you're suddenly in the big league. So that was what happened with Rachel's song getting played on every easy listening radio station around the country. And I started getting mail from all over the country. People would track me down and write me letters and tell me how much they enjoyed the music and how much it touched their lives. And then did you make it available for sale at any point? But that was the next challenge, as you, as you can imagine. <laughs> then, and here I am, all I have is a cassette tape and, uh, uh, at that point, I didn't even have a CD. So this was 1986, yeah. 87 time frame. By 1988, I had written some more music and I went back to Nashville and recorded more songs with Gary Prim. Nice. And we came out with the album, Rachel's Song. It's the first song on there, of course. And so then finally, I did have a product that I could sell to somebody if they wanted to, to purchase it. And they mm -hmm. all did. So I had cassette tapes made and a CD made of Rachel's song. So now I have a product and I have a bunch of people that want it. The next question or challenge for any entrepreneur is, how do you, how do you let people know about your product? Yeah. You know, they, they can hear it on the radio, that's a number of people, but that's a small fraction of the total population. How and do this, you, yeah. Yeah, and this is still be before the internet, before yeah. all the ways that you can market a product yeah. nowadays. Yeah. I so mean, how in the world am I going to, that is, that was, and my wife and I sat down many hours trying to figure out how can we basically get the music out there and let people be aware of it. And, you know, we, we tried, I did try to approach the big box stores. We, back then we had, we did have record stores. They mm -hmm. called them, that's because they literally sold vinyl records. And so I approached the, the big chains of record stores thinking that they would be happy to carry my Rachel song because it was such a beautiful song. Turns out they wouldn't even hardly answer my phone, let alone talk to me about it. I didn't have a name. They were only interested in a big name that was re instantly recognizable. So that didn't work out. So now I'm back to square one again. How do I get my music out into the world other than radio? Yeah. And then this is the story, and I, I, I'm, I encourage people to read the whole details. It's in my book about how I started with one gift shop, playing and selling my music. Now, those of you that travel around on vacation, you go to a tourist town, you go into a, a really nice gift shop. Nine times out of 10, you walk in, it looks good, it smells good, and it sounds good. And most of the time, they're playing pretty music in the shop. Yeah. You know, it's not going to be really loud, bumpy kind of music. It's going to be very <laughs> soft, soothing. Soothing, makes you want to stay there, makes you want yeah, to show just, off, just inviting. Yeah, just time. The, more, the longer they're in there, the more they're going to buy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyhow, that was the, the, the venue that I eventually landed upon to sell my music. And, I, and it was called the Play and Sell Market. And me and two other musicians around the country or the ones who invented that sales channel. Back then, nobody else did it. It was Amazing. me and a, a guy on the West Coast and a guy in the middle of the country. That's how we discovered that would play and sell our music. And we, it became known as play and sell market. And today, everybody does it. But back then, it was just me and two other people. So the long story short is I was able to go from one gift shop 
to over a thousand gift shops covering the entire country in tourist towns all over the United States. And the story of how I did that is in my book. I would encourage your entrepreneurs to read about that. It'd take longer than we have here on the yeah. podcast <laughs> to go into all those details, but it's an interesting story of how I used big data, which wasn't even called big data back then. It was just numbers and, and some, since I'm an anal analytical person, yeah. <laughs> I, I will use my analytical thinking to, to help me through this process. And I talk about that in the book. So, but, yeah. So I really am curious because you're still working your day job at this point. At that point I was because I didn't, I wasn't able to quit my day job until mm -hmm. 1992. Mm -hmm. And so beginning with Rachel's song in 1986, the mm -hmm. album, 1980, I mean, 88, in 1989, I came out with a Christmas album, mm -hmm. and shortly thereafter with another album of original music that I did get busy and write more songs, and it's called Beautiful Thoughts, and it's, it's, it's also one of my favorite albums, and it's called Beautiful Thoughts. So every year thereafter, I would come out with it, go back to Nashville and produce another album because I began accumulating my mailing list. Now, when you sell something direct mail, direct to the consumer, yeah. You better keep all those addresses and today in today's market, you keep their email addresses. But back then it was their USPS, you know, their regular yeah. mailing, physical mailing address. Well, I had grown my mailing list to in up to several thousand at this point. Once because I had I had the wisdom to put in the back of my cassette tapes and CDs a little, a little tear out card. To send me this if you want on my mailing list. Well, I get thousands of those little cards coming in that said, yeah, if you come out with something new, let me know. Well, I did. And, <laughs> and you know, my, my response rate initially after Rachel's song, the second album was virtually 100%. That's amazing. Everybody on my list bought the second album and virtually everybody bought the third album. And by the fourth, it was a little lower, but I was in, in amazed that you know when 90 percent of your people buy another product for you that's almost unheard of now that's that's customer loyalty for you very much so that's so unheard of i mean especially in today's world where everybody get does email marketing you get so many emails and most of them you just you know don't read because yeah, yeah and but i think this is really important for entrepreneurs too is the way you built this up because i'm really seeing a lot of um the trend going back towards people want to get mail it like mm -hmm. in their mailboxes because it's more unusual to get something that way. Mm -hmm. It's so you know, we're such an easy economy, you know, you go online, but I think marketing and doing more direct mail marketing with fun items and things like that, or letting people know who are really interested and engaged with your product is um, an old school tactic that needs to make a big comeback because yeah. we get, you know, email overload. It's so much easier to unsubscribe, unsubscribe, unsubscribe. Mm -hmm. And even with, you know, when you do a podcast like this, you may have, let's say 10,000 people listening to it, but what percentage of those 10,000 are actually going to go over to their computer and type in combsmusic.com <laughs> and go to my website and click on Rachel song and listen to it. Mm -hmm. And maybe even go to Amazon and buy the book or go to Amazon and buy my CD or whatever, or download it probably a very small percentage. I am finding, and you are probably aware of this too, that the response, the, uh, the conversion rate for anything electronic these days is a tiny fraction. It really you, is, yeah. I've had people tell me that if you get one out of a thousand people, sometimes that's a, a pretty good hit rate because what they do is they just, it's a shotgun approach. You send out a million emails. If you get 1% back, well, that's a pretty big number, but it's nowhere, if you got back what I did when I started out, <laughs> You'd be a gazillionaire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and to that point, so you have released, you really started releasing an album every single year. Mm -hmm. How many songs have you created? Have you composed? I have personal, personally written over 120. Oh my gosh. And Gary Prem and I have been in the studio recording over 170 because several of the re songs that we recorded, I have four albums of favorite hymns. Of course, I didn't write those. And I have an album of favorite songs like Moon River, Misty, and more, oh, yeah. all the pretty songs that I grew up yeah. enjoying. And then I have a patriotic album called Celebrate Freedom. And I have a Christmas album as well. So that I've got, you know, seven originals, four hymns, and the patriotic, you know, I've, so I've got several. 
but I've recorded over 170. Oh my gosh. And all of those are available to be streamed and downloaded on virtually every one of the media that mediums that uh, people are used to going and getting their music and even sheet music. I had to go because there are piano players in the world like me. Every time when I was growing up playing the piano, if I heard a beautiful song first time on the piano, on the radio, I wanted to go buy the sheet music because yeah. I wanted to play that song too. You know, think about the theme from Love Story. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that Henry Mancini wrote. Uh, that's a beautiful song to play and it's not that hard, but it sure is a pretty song. Well, I needed to do the same thing with my music. Oh, so awesome. very soon, one of the second thing I did after rec getting Rachel's song recorded, I transcribed that song that Gary played. And that was his arrangement. So it wasn't, I, I was not the one that wrote out the notes. I had to do it by ear. I had to listen to his recording of my song oh my God. and say, what now, what note is he playing on? And I'd, I'd, I'd hit a rewind and play it, rewind and play till I, I got every note just right for every measure of that song. And I published the sheet music, a sheet music single of just Rachel's song. Sold thousand, I think it was, I sold 5,000 copies of just the individual <laughs> sheet music song. People wanted to use it to play in weddings. They wanted to use it for you know, in special uh, music in a church service. They wanted to use it for all kinds of occasions or just for their own enjoyment. They just loved pray, playing Rachel's song. And, and movies. It, it, I'm, I'm sorry. And movies. And uh, well, uh, I have never had my music played for movies. Uh, I, 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 I've hoped that it would initially a long time ago. I had people said, whoa, that sounds like a theme theme song for a, a love story movie. Mm. And I would have, it probably would have been nice to have had a big star, you know, great big hit movie that played Rachel's song as the, uh, the theme song. But in, link, in thinking back about it, it probably was a blessing to me that that did not happen because mm -hmm. when you basically write music for a movie or a, a big production, most musicians lose control of the song. The, the the movie company is going to want to own the, the rights to publish and sell that music that's associated with their movie. And then you would lose control. But so far, knock on wood, I still own 100% of the intellectual property of all of my music. Nobody has ever, uh, I've never collaborated with anybody else where they own half of the song and I only own half of it. It's, mm -hmm. I still own all of it. So I'm in control as an entrepreneur. I can do put it up on YouTube myself. I can put it forever because I own the song. Yeah. And I think that's a blessing in, in, in disguise that at least looking back on it, it was, I'm glad that nobody ever picked it up maybe. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I love the way you tell your story and it's the way that you are weaving the narrative. It seems like everything was, it just built upon each other. Um, mm -hmm. But I have to say, going back to when you were young, having that entrepreneurial drive, being interested in how things work and having that attitude, that's, that set you out on that path to success and to be able to not just make one song and stop there, but to be, and well, and also your love of music, obviously, um, but to be able to continue and to be so prolific, I think there are a lot of people who wouldn't have done that, especially you had a day job, you have a busy life, you have a family, you have you know, church, you have all these other things going on. Um, but to stay in that space, in that zone of inspiration mm -hmm. and to continue inspiring others. And I know that's something that is one of your discussion topics is how much music has moved people and how it has inspired people and how it's helped them, you know, sometimes in very tough times to mm -hmm. get to that next stage of their life and to, to continue and to feel like, you know, like they mean something and that there's somewhere for them to be and somewhere for them to belong and go. Yeah, exactly. Because I have heard from over now over 50,000 people. Oh my gosh. Now, if, if, if you want to see what 50,000 letters and notes <laughs> look like, I do have a photograph of my wife and I got our boxes out because we, we kept all of these letters and notes. They're in boxes by year back in my storage room here. And I had enough of these boxes, and these are like moving, you know, the yeah. boxes you use when you're going to move full. I put them on my pool table. I've got a, you know, a nine foot pool table out here. 
And so we put these boxes of these letters and notes on my pool table. You can't tell there's a pool table underneath it. It is. It was stacked full all the way around, mm -hmm. middle and sides of all these notes and letters. That is a lot of correspondence over the years. And I published in my book, in chapter 21 of my book, there's 22 pages of just some of the special notes mm -hmm. that I got over the years. I selected some that were the I liked the best and put them in my book. And I love reading those because they're just so inspirational. They're, they're touching, they're, they're genuine, they're from the heart, and they're confirming. They mm -hmm. tell me over, you know, anytime I'm having any doubts or questions about them, am I doing the right thing? I'm, I'm hitting a brick wall here. What's, what's going on here? I read some of these stories and it's reaffirming that, yep, you're on the right path. Just keep at it. Keep taking action and don't be discouraged. And just remember that no doesn't mean no. Sometimes no <laughs> just means not yet. So anyhow, it's, so those notes and letters really inspired me to really to write my book and to get these stories out to hopefully maybe my story will inspire somebody. If I, if this podcast just reaches one person that says, okay, I'm getting off my duff now and I'm going to do something mm -hmm. with my, whatever it is that I've been thinking about now for a long time, I want to do something that will have made it worthwhile to me because yeah. then you, you really have touched somebody's life in a positive and meaningful way and they will benefit from it. And yeah, you know, I probably never know about it unless they sit down and write me a letter <laughs> or something, but that's, that's the kind of uh, feedback and that's the reward as far as I'm concerned is to realize that people need these kind of inspirational and encouraging stories, yeah. get them to, to move ahead and, and I, I, there are three kinds of moments that I have in my book I describe. There are defining moments in your life, mm -hmm. and those are moments that something happens to you. You have no control over what's happening. It could be as big as a 9-11 you know, event in the United States, mm -hmm. or it could be as, you know, as, as small as you know, some accidental something that happened in your life that you, you really had no control over whether it's a, you know, an illness or a, a, you met some person that be, you, you become engaged with and later marry that person or whatever it is, but you, you, something happened that you didn't control. Those are defining moments. Now, there are other moments that we call threshold moments, and those are the moments where you come up to a threshold, like at a door, and you'd have to, you have to decide what to do next. Am I going to go through that door and take this chance? Am I going to go take the right fork in the road or the left fork in the road? Am I going to just sit here and do nothing? Or, you know, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And so those are really important moments in your life that are really important or can be important of your future success. So those are threshold moments. And the third category of moments I called aha moments. And those are the moments that are so special that you're sitting there and something happens like when I heard Gary Prim play Rachel's song, and it sounded as good as anything I'd ever heard on the radio. That was my aha moment. Now, here's, I, was th I still remember what I was thinking. I thought, this is it. This is it. Now, I didn't know what it was. <laughs> you know, it, you, you, all you know is this, this is important. This is going to be important, but I don't know where this is going to lead, but this is really, really important. So those are the aha moments in your life. And so I think how you deal with your, 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 your defining moments and your mm -hmm. threshold moments and your aha moments is really important to how you succeed and where you go for the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of that, so you, when you were still working and then you, um, did the music just take over so much that you said, you know what, I can quit my day job now. I can just be full-time in music, which is something you were passionate about, but had also turned into a business. Well, the, the business part of it was, this, as I was describing, selling the tapes yeah. and CDs through the yeah. gift shops. Yeah. Well, that took off in such a, a, a manner that I had to hire a full-time office manager to help me. I was still working, and so I needed somebody back home. She worked out of my basement in my house, answering the phone, taking orders from gift shops all over the country, and also orders from fans who would mm -hmm. call on an 800 number and say, I want to order a, a CD of Rachel's song. Yeah. And so she'd take the credit card and, and take down the order and, and get it ready to ship out. Well, that grew to the point where by 1991, 
the profits from my music sales were far exceeding what I was making at AT and T. Now, and and I I come from a family that my father worked for a large corporation and my mother worked in an industrial sewing factory, mm -hmm. but prior to that they were all farmers. So I'm a second generation working for a large company. So Western Electric was a wonderful company to work for, and my family was so happy when I got that job. And I was expected, and and I people expected me to, and I was expecting to work there till I retired. Yeah. You know, you work, you go to work for a big company that's paying good, whether it's IBM or GE or some big corporation. You were expected to work there till you earned your 30 year pen and you're you're retired and you know, it, it's that's that's your job. So for me, when I was in and this was 1991, I had been with AT&T 40, uh, 20, 20, going on 24 years. Wow. So I had I didn't have the 25 year mark yet. Mm -hmm. And I didn't I wasn't 50 years old either. I was only 44 years old. And so I was six years away from the, the magic number on the age. I was years away on how many years service I had. So, and my music was going through the roof and, and I was having to be eight hours a day over here and, and working at my job. Yeah. And mean, meanwhile, here's my business at home doing twice what I'm doing at work. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, you know, when, when do <laughs> I turn loose of my full-time job and do my, my music full-time? So I'm sitting at church one morning because I had been praying about this. It's one of those things, a big decision in your life when you're gonna quit your job and do mm -hmm. something else full time. And I'd said, I need a sign. Lord, I need a sign. Tell me when will I know? How will I know when it's time for me to quit my job and do my music? And I'm sitting there and I realized, I recalled a letter that I got that week from a fan. Mm -hmm. And it was a letter, just a little one sentence letter from a man. And he says, Dave Combs, Music is what God puts you on this planet to do. Signed his name. And I thought, hmm, was that the man talking to me or was it the man upstairs talking to me? You, yeah. Yeah. And so, and I realized I had, that wasn't the only letter like that I'd gotten. People were really saying that your music is really touching people's lives. And I thought to myself, here I had been expecting the lightning bolt or the, the thunder to roll and the burning bush and all the, the, the big things to happen to re reveal to me that, yeah, now's the time, Dave. No, go do it. <laughs> and I didn't realize that, you know, God speaks to us through other people. It was sometimes. right there all the time. It was right there in front of me all the time. <laughs> and I kind of chuckled to myself sitting there in the church and I thought, Oh, Lord, you probably think I am the densest Christian on the planet because mm -hmm. here you've sent me thousands of letters telling me <laughs> what I need to do. Yep, and yep. I've been I've been praying for the burning bush and the lightning bolt. And you've already told me a thousand times here what to do. So I, that after we went home after church that day, and I told Linda, I said, OK, tomorrow I'm turning my resignation in to my boss and wow. we're going to do it. And that's how I made my decision, because it wasn't a, a, a matter of money the money was already overtaking my salary but it was that that inner drive that I, why would you give up working for a fine yeah. corporation and steady and you know that you know. steady yeah. income and the in, you know the insurance and the health benefits all those kind of things how can we do this but it has worked out marvelously i never look back i have had not one ounce of regret in making that decision i love it Thank you so much. This is such an inspiring journey that you took us on. Your story is amazing and beautiful. What's next? Well, that's a good question. Here, I'm going to be 75 years old in about a week and a half. And, Happy uh, birthday. And my, thank you. And my wife's going to be retiring from her job as controller of the state of North Carolina at the end of June. We hope to do a little bit of traveling now that hopefully the, the COVID virus is hopefully stays low enough to where we can visit some relatives and friends mm -hmm. that we haven't seen in two or three yeah. years. So we want to do a little traveling, but my music is still a big priority for me. I am appearing on three or four of these podcasts almost every day, telling my story and trying to get the word out to, to people that have never heard of Rachel's song or any yeah. of my music because yeah, it's been played millions of times. Millions of people have heard it, but how many millions of people are on this planet? There are billions of people on the planet. 
that have never heard my music. So my goal, one of my goals is to spread my music around the world as best I can because I know when people hear my music in the right environment, in the right place, it brings them peace and tranquility and it reaches into their soul and does something really positive for them. And so yes. that's, that's my long-term objective. And thank goodness we have the internet today yeah. because <laughs> whether you're here, like this morning, I had to get up at three o'clock in the morning oh, for a podcast for a lady in Germany. And she'd already been up for eight, eight or nine hours but I had to get up three o'clock in the morning to be on her podcast. Wonderful interview. But isn't it amazing that here we can be right? looks like you might as well be in the room right next yeah. to me. Because <laughs> there's no delay. It's, it's, this technology has really allowed us to communicate with anybody anywhere in the world just like that. So I'm blessed to have that available as well. And I'm, I'm trying to take advantage of that as much as I can. Wow. Well, thank you very much for sharing your story with us today. I know I'm inspired. Um, I've been on your website. I'm going to do more on your website and listen to the song a few more times. And just, uh, you know, yeah, it gives you, this is a great way to just end, almost end the week and mm -hmm. feel like, okay, I'm refreshed to go into the weekend and mm -hmm. continue down this road of inspiration and um, abundance and really living. I love that you've been able to really live in that space of everything you love and enjoy and that what inspires you can inspire so many. So Dave, exactly. thank you so much for being here. Any last uh, thoughts you want to share with the audience? I just want to thank you, Annika, for the privilege of being yeah. on your program today. It's been a real joy just to talk with you and uh, I wish you the best with your podcast and with your audience. And uh, I know you're going to do well and I just uh, <laughs> applaud you for what you're doing. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I will have all of your information in the show notes for our audience. So that way they can go to your website. They can know where to find your book and listen to your music. So thank you everybody for coming back and listening to this really inspirational episode of Your Brand Amplified. I'll be back again next week. Want more? Check out AmplifyWithAnnika.com or follow me on socials at Amplify with Annika. Stop using five apps to manage your marketing. Meet Simplified One. It's an AI-powered all-in-one platform for creators and small businesses to design, make videos, and publish content to all social media platforms. Visit simplified.com and use Annika30 to save 30% today.